Thank you. Hey, everyone. Oh, my. That was quite an introduction. I don't know how we're going to move up to that, but thank you. Thank you, Hayden and, and team and everybody who put this um, amazing conference together. Uh, I was able to float in and out of some sessions today, and um, it's just amazing to see how much we all have in common, how we're all working on the same issues and um, how we're having you know, success across the country in a way that we've, we haven't had recently. So um, I know all of the, the pain and, and suffering we've, we've been going through the past couple of years um, with COVID and um, just know how you know, ridership is down and how upsetting that is to all of us. But the fact that this group and this team is working um, tirelessly uh, to get folks back into, into systems is just, is just really amazing to see. So um, thank you. Thank you all for your tireless advocacy and your innovation and your hard work. Um, so as, as, as everybody mentioned, I'm Sarah Meyer, Chief Customer Officer with the MTA in New York. Uh, I'm Joe Chan, I'm a Senior Director for Creative uh, at the MTA, and we're, yeah, as Sarah said, we're super honored and excited to be with you today, and um, yeah, the, the workshops we've been able to pop into have been amazing. Um, can everyone see uh, our, our deck? Is that up on screen? Yes, greetings from yeah, New York awesome. City. Great. And you see us as well? Sorry, I don't know this whole Zoom thing. You see, we're on camera as <laughs> we, well still? I'll we see everything. Okay, yeah, okay. we're good. Okay, we didn't do anything incriminating, <laughs> and um, we'll, we'll stay on topic. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so. I'll just, um, before we start, I just wanted to give a shout out to our 70,000 colleagues at the MTA who've worked nonstop since Friday uh, to keep trains and buses and information flowing. Um, making sure that everybody is safe and sound where they needed to go, where they needed to get to. Um, so just wanted to, to send those thanks and um, to give our support to networks that are further north that might have been hit uh, even harder than we were. Yeah, and that, that photograph on the slide is um, the best part of snow in New York. It's like basically the first day. Today we're in the second day where it's basically just like sludgy and brown and uh, not as pretty as that. But um, well, um, that's, a, that's a pretty picture to start with. Um, so um, our, uh, our talk today is um, uh, maybe a little bit different than some of the other um, talks today in that we're going to kind of go into our biographies, hopefully not in a self-indulgent or boring way, but as a way to um, sort of make the connection between how we've been doing um, uh, com customer comms and customer experience in New York uh, at MTA based on our particular, um, and in some ways like unlikely, I think, um, journeys to the MTA. So um, we hope that's of interest to you guys. Um, and uh, we're really excited to hear your questions and answers afterwards. Yeah, exactly. And um, also hoping that, you know, our experiences and our approach gives um, you guys something a little extra to think about, uh, perhaps adding some some tools and some toolkits to, to your already um, full toolboxes. So thanks. Cool. And do I know how to change the slide? I hope so. Okay, if I move this here. There we okay. go. Yes, it worked. Okay. Um, so a little context um, for those of you guys um, I, who are less familiar with us, um, uh, the MTA is the New York City Metro Region's public transportation uh, agency, and we serve a region of 15 million people over a service area of about 5,000 square miles. Um, we operate the subway and the public buses in New York City. We operate the Long Island Railroad, um, which serves Nassau and Suffolk counties on Long Island, and Metro North, which serves the counties north of the city in Connecticut. Um, we have a bridges and tunnels division um, that operates several tow crossings within New York City, um, and the surplus funds from bridges and tunnels helps fund public transit in New York. Um, and we also have a construction development agency that manages our capital building program and uh, revenue generating activities. So pre-pandemic, we averaged about 5.5 million weekday riders uh, on the subways and 2.2 million on the buses. Our, our railroads carried around 700,000 people um, and bridges and tunnels carried about a million vehicles. So like other transit agencies, our trains and buses um, have been uh, in steep declines in ridership due to the pandemic. Our bridges and tunnels, however, are back to their pre-pandemic levels, uh, meaning that people are driving back to New York, but not quite returning to public transit. So it's a huge challenge and it's what we're completely focused on here at the MTA. Oh, how does this work? <laughs> Just click on the screen on the PowerPoint. No, there we go. There we go. Okay. 
Um, so I live in New York City, obviously, with my husband and two daughters. Uh, I was born here, uh, but my parents moved us to northern New Jersey, and I spent the majority of my childhood in traffic on the George Washington Bridge, commuting back and forth. Um, I then went to Boston, uh, where I went to Wellesley. Um, I'm a huge advocate for all women's colleges, um, for those who need it. I, it's where I learned uh, to speak, really. I was very shy in high school, um, and it gave me the confidence that I needed to um, stand up for my point of view. I majored in art history, um, which was such a wonderful, wonderful way to bring together a lot of my interests, um, design, history, psychology, uh, just really digging into what artists were feeling during while they were painting, what was happening during that time. And after school, I worked in marketing and advertising at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I had a total blast, um, but I made $23,000 a year, um, which, you know, didn't didn't really pay for things. So I uh, had to keep keep looking and um, went to DC, worked in political advertising for a little while. Um, and then just continued to work with nonprofits and advocacy organizations on their websites. Uh, this is when websites were, were a new thing um, and tried to always make sure that information was easy to find and that our uh, missions were, were really easy and, and pronounced. Um, I moved back to DC uh, to continue communications and fundraising work. I worked on issues that were really important to me, like marriage equality, mental health. Um, one of my favorite clients was the Lady Gaga's Born This Way Foundation. That was super fun. Um, and, uh, you know, I also was, was a news junkie. Um, I was one of those, you know, first signups to Twitter and um, just really loved reading the New York Times online. Um, it's the first thing I did when I woke up in the morning. Um, so I wanted to move to, to PR and crisis communications. It, it just seemed to be where the action was. And um, I did a lot of um, crisis communications work for um, automotive. Um, and when I went to Edelman, which was um, the last PR firm that I worked at, they, uh, one of my first clients was the Virgin Galactic um, spaceship accounts. And um, honestly, the second week I was assigned to this account was the Spaceship Two crash. I don't know if you guys remember that, but I was the, the um, person that literally tweeted what was going on. And it was this really um, incredible story where actually one of the pilots ended up surviving the crash. And um, it was remarkable to sort of watch how this all unfolded. And my first um, foray into NTSB world and, and all of that. So um, being in PR, I all of a sudden was the transportation expert <laughs> because I had worked on um, this, this spaceship crash. Uh, so, you know, it was really, really interesting. Um, and all of a sudden, uh, fast forward to 2017, and our subways were in crisis. Um, we had a number of really high profile incidents that happened and um, the governor declared a state of emergency and uh, wanted an immediate sort of audit of all of the communications and how they flew, how they um, uh, flowed around the organization. Um, and he was giving uh, everybody sort of this direction that they needed to be improved immediately. So, um, I walked into the Rail Control Center and I've been hooked ever since. So um, really, really fortunate to meet Joe and I'll let him introduce himself now. Uh, thanks, Wow, that's an incredible story. Um, so I, um, I was born and raised in New Jersey um, and I grew up in a working class immigrant household, um, not too far from New York City, but culturally, you know, very different. Um, uh, I fell in love with New York City as a child when my parents would drive me, drive us into Chinatown uh, in Manhattan, um, where my, to visit my grandmother, who was working in a garment factory on Canal Street. Um, but I just, you know, the city was always in my imagination. Um, so I was um, fortunate to attend NYU, um, uh, where I studied politics and economics. Uh, and after graduating, um, I worked at NYU for a few years doing marketing of their um, summer sessions. Um, I wanted to do grad school uh, and I was looking at grad school options at NYU and I was originally wanted to do film because I was always been fascinated by film, loved sci-fi movies growing up and I um, just wanted to learn how to use that medium to tell stories. Um, but around the time I was thinking about grad school, I also read The Power Broker and that floored me and changed 
my whole view of the city I had been admiring from afar for so long and I had finally gotten a chance to live in. Um, cities didn't happen by accident. Uh, the, the development of a, an urban um, area is, is often, um, you know, intentional and, um, and uh, reading how much um, Robert Moses did to New York or did for New York, depending on your opinion of him, um, you know, just blew me away. Uh, and so I enrolled in the Ur Masters of Urban Planning program at NYU and got a degree there. Uh, and then a few months after graduating, I um, went to uh, to work at the MTA. I was a junior analyst there. And um, my job, my first job was counting ridership and revenue from every single turnstile for every single day of the of the month the year. So I had never seen an Excel spreadsheet so large before. And um, it was, uh, you know, I, uh, I got a lot better at Excel. <laughs> um, so after a couple of years of this, um, I remember that I uh, had always been interested in film and in storytelling and, you know, needed to develop that side of myself. So I got involved with the Asian American theater and film community in New York, um, which was just a small sort of circle subset of the, you know, film and and um, theater, um, but it was an incredibly supportive, informative um, experience. And I um, wound up uh, writing and directing several short films, eventually a feature film that uh, was on Netflix for a few years. Um, and uh, yeah, just kind of you know, wrote and directed these short films, took them to film festivals, learned about the business while I was trying to learn how to tell, use the visual language of film. Um, I had a day job, which was very steady at the MTA, counting revenue and ridership. And then I had this like, you know, night and weekend uh, gig. Um, and I never thought they would sort of ever meet. Um, um, but in about, I think 2009 or so, the MTA had a new CEO come on board and he wanted to revamp the way the MTA was speaking to its customers. And I raised my hand and I said, hey, I know how to make, uh, you know, videos on, if you give me a shot, I can start a YouTube channel for you and we can put MTA stuff on it. And so, you know, after I got the question, what is, I had to explain what is YouTube, this was 2009, um, they said, oh yeah, sure, go ahead. Like, you know, it seemed harmless. Um, uh, so I, I did that for several years as a one man band at the MTA, just, you know, um, writing, shooting videos, putting them up on YouTube and seeing how they did, trying to get better at storytelling, um, but having a lot of fun telling the MTA story um, and it's a medium that the MTA hadn't fully exploited at that time and certainly, you know, wasn't doing it online in any way. Um, so, uh, yeah, and then my, I just eventually grew a team and now I'm the head of um, creative services at the MTA. I have a team of about 25 people. Um, we have designers, we have videographers, we have map makers, we have copywriters, animators, illustrators. Um, and so we do all the visual communications for um, the MTA and it's, it's a lot of fun and I work for Sarah, which is amazing. Um, so, so great. So Joe and I began working together in 2018 under the new transit president, Andy Byford. Andy had an ambitious goal to revitalize New York City transit outlined in a plan we wrote called Fast Forward. He put the customer at the center um, and ignited a culture change in an organization that had seen its fair share of big plans come and go. Yeah, I mean, and, and as you guys know, Andy Byford, um, he's now at London at TFL, but what he did in his two short years at MTA really left an impression on the institution um, and certainly everyone who worked with him and frankly, New York. I think um, he opened um, uh, our eyes to what transit could be in New York. Um, so we've got some terrific leadership at the MTA um, since Andy and, you know, um, a lot of exciting stuff coming, um, but uh, he really sort of open the door to a lot of things, I think. Yeah. Um, and uh, what you're seeing on the screen, which is a transit con exclusive, uh, this was actually the poster we gave him at his going away party. So uh, um, I hope it's in his living room, but this is now in your living room. It better be in your living room, Andy. <laughs> um, so what we both learned from Andy and from our re respective experiences, mine in crisis comms and Joe's in filmmaking, is how important storytelling and respecting the audience is. So if you're from other fields, these words and phrases might have different meanings. So we're going to go um, through a couple um, of these slides in detail. Go ahead. Yeah. So what do we mean by storytelling? To be clear, when we say storytelling, we are not talking about fictionalizing or deceiving or even like spinning something. We are public servants. We are here. We serve the public. And um, we believe at our core in transparency. So when we're talking about 
storytelling really. We're, we're actually talking about it on a deeper, more fundamental level of how human beings understand the world around them. Um, and, uh, and we generally understand the world in a narrative way as a story, the, the story of our life, which you've heard of, you know, a beginning, a middle and an end. You know, we just naturally um, parse information that way. We connect what we believe is a cause to what we believe is an effect. Um, we make a connection there. Um, we see things, you know, as I said, often subconsciously as having a beginning, a middle, and an end. We sometimes look for heroes and villains in a story, whether or not they actually exist. It's just hardwired into us to make those kind of connections and understand the world in that way. And if you don't have all the information you expect, you will often sort of infer or sometimes, you know, whole, wholesale sort of create what um, a way to connect those dots. So, I mean, if if I'm speaking a little bit too abstractly here, I would say, you know, think of your favorite movies or novels, um, you know, what made them your favorite? On a structural level, it's very likely that the author or the director focused your attention on the right thing at the right time to keep you wanting to see what would happen next. In the case of public transit, our version of storytelling is understanding what a traveler on our systems wants to know at every moment of the journey. So we need to focus their attention on what they need to know, where and when they need to know it. So one example of how we did this was by eliminating the constant, unhelpful, most irritating announcement of all time. There is train traffic ahead of us. You guys remember that? It was constant. If you were in New York, you heard it so many times, you said it in your sleep. And we just wanted to know, you know, what do you mean train traffic is ahead of us? Why isn't the train traffic ahead of us moving? What is happening ahead of us? So that's uh, an example also of the second slide that I've just put up, um, which is respecting the audience. And in put simply, it's about respecting their time and their intelligence. We respect their time by doing the hard work of understanding what they need to know, when and where they need to know it, rather than throwing a lot of information at them and asking them to sort it out. Um, it's harder work to do it this way. Um, but uh, and oftentimes, you know, institutions, especially public ones, will err on the side of, I gotta say, caution to put everything out there so we cannot be accused of omitting important information. But I think that's only, that's, that's not completely fulfilling what we're here to do as people who work in customer communications and customer experience. We have to curate the information and we have to work harder to think about what the journey, what the rider needs to know at what point in the journey. So, um, we would have to respect their time. You know, we have to deliver information in as concise a way as possible that's easy to understand and is clear and is transparent. Um, we want to respect their intelligence by being transparent about what's happening. We don't want to dumb it down as the example Sarah just gave, you know, or be, you know, vague or coy. You know, people are collectively quite sophisticated. The audience is collectively smarter than us, you know. Um, especially in New York City, where it's media capital, they're bombarded with messages all the time. They're very sophisticated in figuring out what's real and what's not. Um, and so we have a duty to them um, as New Yorkers to talk to, you know, to talk to New Yorkers like New Yorkers and all of you and your customers to talk to you and them in a, in a very real way. So that's what we mean by respecting the audience and what we mean by storytelling. Um, it's harder work. It is harder work and it is riskier in a lot of ways because you run the risk that you may be accused of uh, omitting some information, some critical point. Um, we don't always get it right, um, but we know we need to try. Um, that's the important thing because that is respecting the audience. Thanks, Joe. So as a first step in replacing that announcement that I will not say again. Um, we asked Subways for documentation on how communications flow to customers. This is what they sent me. Um, we call it the spaghetti chart. Um, and so I hope that it gives you a glimpse into uh, why it's so hard to get information out to conductors. Um, we use really, really primitive technology at the end of the day. It's an old radio. Um, and then we've layered on a lot of different systems um, that are each responsible for sort of like one tiny piece. Uh, then we've tried to layer on other systems that take some of the other systems and mash it all together and try and put out something that, that works, right? It's, it's they're, they're band-aids, they're not um, the uh, one system that works, right? Um, and so that's been frustrating. 
Um, over the, over the past couple of years, we've made some progress. Uh, three of these systems no longer exist, which is great. Um, uh, we've combined them into one, but it took a ton of work and, and honestly millions of dollars. And those are millions of dollars that we'd love to put into operating money, right? Um, running more trains and buses. So, um, you know, a lot of these systems weren't built with integration in mind. Um, and they were just band-aids for isolated issues. So what was the low hanging fruit that we could change now? Could we put iPads into conductor cabs to get them more information? Connectivity is an issue in our tunnels, but could we try? Sure, but we don't have the time to train the conductors on how to use the iPads, but could we try? Um, well, we're coming up with labor negotiations right now. So, you know, I don't think it's the best time. You know, it's, it's just we kept running into brick walls. Um, but we had to keep looking for that low hanging fruit. So we went back to basics. Next slide, Joe. We printed out tiny little books that fit into a conductor's pocket and rewrote every single announcement with the customer in mind. We got rid of archaic greetings like ladies and gentlemen. We asked conductors to give reasons for delays, to give alternatives so customers could make better decisions. Should they transfer? Should they try the bus? Um, again, trying to give more helpful and more accurate information. We even tried out a British accent to see if that would improve clarity of the speaker system in our older subway cars and stations. Unfortunately, it didn't. And so that's when we started focusing on social media and screens for assistance. We put a significant investment into better delivering, better delivering service information to people's phones, to our digital screens in the system, um, and also answering one-on-one -on -one inquiries. To give you a sense of scale, in December, we put out 3,900 subway service alerts, 2,200 bus alerts, and we answered 60,000 phone calls from our 511 system, 8,700 phone calls from our help point system, that those are in our subway stations. We answered um, and we received 25,000 tweets, 14,000 WhatsApp DM messages, and 1,400 iMessages. So it's been a really, really gratifying experience to be able to answer our customers one-on-one. -on -one. Of course, Joe and I have been really focused and the rest of the team as well, have an amazing, amazing leadership team and, and workforce um, who continue to try and think of ways to prevent the inquiry from coming in in the first place. So Joe's gonna talk about a couple things um, on that sense and on that scale. So, uh... Another example of how we put these principles into practice is um, involves what we'll call the CIC project. So the CIC is, stands for Customer Information Center, and that is a, it's a decades old system of printed customer information like maps and scheduled, and it's play, they're placed inside frames um, inside the, uh, the near the fare array of uh, every um, subway station that we have. Um, the photo you see here is actually from 2018, so things have changed a little bit since then, but I'll be coming back to this photo as an example of what we kind of started with and our thinking through as we looked at each product um, and uh, tried to improve it. So um, the dual screens, so um, over the last several years, um, uh, the MTA with Outfront Media, our advertising partner, has installed an extensive digital signage system throughout the entire MTA. I think a full build is gonna be like 10,000 screens, I believe. And I know Outfront's a, a sponsor for of this uh, event, so shout out to them. Um, they've been terrific partners. Um, these screens are primarily used to carry advertising. However, uh, the MDA has de uh, screens dedicated to um, uh, service information. Um, and we also have some time on the advertising screens as well. And so that has been a huge um, uh, benefit to us in being able to deliver um, very, uh, very quickly um, dynamic information to our customers. However, um, in bringing these um, screens into our stations and on board our trains and buses, um, there was a little bit of an oversight, and that's what we should be doing uh, with the rest of the information um, uh, canvases uh, that we have in that control area. And also, frankly, how better to use the, um, 
to screens. We'd never had anything like that at that scale uh, in the New York City subway system before. And so there was just a lot of stuff that wasn't known. So when I came to the project, um, one of the first things um, we did was like to take a look at what's out there. You know, are we using the best use of digital and are we making the best use of um, uh, the other medias that we have available to us? Um, so you'll see just in this photograph on the left, um, again, this was a couple of years ago, but on the left are the new screens that sort of appeared. You'll see if you, if you know New York City, these are actually um, installed in what were the original, I believe, 1930s era IND um, sort of advertising windows, I guess, in a way. Um, so it's funny that they're plopped there. And then you see like the, the CI, the traditional printed CICs, which um, show printed, which have frames that uh, are intended to contain um, printed maps and things. So um, the first thing, well, actually, Sarah, why don't you speak yeah, to this? Yeah, sure. This is your... <laughs> so um, the first thing uh, that we eliminated, I, I call it the wall of shame. Um, I, I don't mean to make light of it because uh, we have some extremely talented uh, folks that have been um, writing these service notices, which are incredibly hard to write. Um, and they kept them updated week after week um, and just, you know, distributed them to each fair array week after week. An incredible amount of effort went into this thing. Um, and it, it worked for a, for a while. Um, that being said, it made our customer do a lot of work, right? You had to like search for what notice would be helpful or relevant to you. There were like four or five different ones for the same time period. And in the fair array, if you're like me, you just wanna to get to the train. You don't have um, the time to sort of scan and look. So, you know, we, by eliminating the wall of shame, we also made um, the work for our team much harder because we had to really curate the messages specific to the stations. Um, that was kind of a hard sell, right? Um, because we were giving everybody so much more work to do, um, but it was what was right and it's what's effective and really glad that we X this thing out. So after the wall of shame, we turned our attention to the digital screens. So these digital screens um, in 2018 were brand new. Um, uh, and uh, they were unlike anything seen in the subway system before. Um, we did have a small experiment with kiosks, uh, interactive kiosks actually, um, but they um, were replaced with these, which were a much wider, um, which had a much wider reach. So you might be saying- yourself, And they're less expensive. And I, do, less expensive. I do have to say. Yes, yes. Um, the interactive ones just didn't scale up, yes. unfortunately. Um, uh, and, so uh, for some of you, if you work at systems that don't have digital, you might look at this and go, oh, this is pretty good. You know, you've got a, you know, got a digital map there. It's static, so it's not dynamic. This is just basically a JPEG that's on a 1080 by 1920 screen. Uh, and then you have next train information. Um, and, you know, for version one, um, you know, product, this was pretty good. You know, no one had seen anything like this. Um, but I had gotten the sense, you know, pretty early on that we weren't really fully exploiting what these screens could be doing. Um, and so, uh, in particular, you know, was this the best use of real estate? We've got a map here. And now the way um, these were originally partitioned is that the left side screen just showed the subway map. It just showed that JPEG and it didn't rotate with anything else. And the other side would show next train um, uh, information, which in a way sort of duplicated what we have on our countdown class, which we've had for over a decade now, which um, sort of hang from the ceiling. It's useful. Certainly you see a whole line of, you know, the next several trains, um, you know, you, it is a full color screen, so that is, um, you know, that's appealing in and of itself. It's just like this bright thing and sometimes a dark station. Um, but could we go further? So we want we investigated that. What else could we be doing? You know, what is one of the most frustrating things about um, uh, being a subway rider in New York sometimes is the New York City subway system, um, you know, is uh, one of the world's few um, systems that has so much four track and three track sections we are you know heavily into have heavily interlined service and whether it's a planned diversion or an unplanned diversion you know trains often wind up in places that customers don't expect them to show up at so you know being that that's one of the biggest pain points for customers uh, for subway riders we're wondering well you know can we can we sort of explain that somehow? Can we sort of shed some light on that problem and sort of meet the challenge using these newfangled screens we have? So, you know, I, I thought to myself, like, how do you describe this kind of irregular service, right? It's like, a, it's a metro. So metros are, you know, have, you know, defined routes 
and you know usually you can short the headways um and you know it's all about regularity um so how do you talk about something that's irregular how do you tell people where their train is actually going to stop so as it turns out we already had an example of this within the mta and it's called our railroads this is a picture of the long island railroad um uh, track uh, sign at Penn Station. We had these at Grand Central as well. And um, you'll see, um, you know, the 8 a.m. Uh, to Huntington and uh, which stops it's going to make between there and Huntington. So, um, you know, it sounds so simple now, but it was a revelation at the time that, you know, you tell the customers where the train is going by telling them where the train is going. <laughs> And what we would wind up showing on these screens would be a contract as sorts of um, between the MTA and the, the passengers in a way that they didn't have before. You know, they knew the train was coming. They didn't know much else about the train um, that was going to be showing up. So um, I sketched out something on my iPad, um, and that's the thing on the left in 20, December 2018. I was just like, OK, well, what could this look like? It'd be a strip map, you know, it would show up, but then it would still show the next couple of trains underneath it. Um, maybe the further trains away would be, you know, a darker gray and the closer ones. And then we might be, have a way to sort of have tags to say late night service or service change of some sort. Um, I sketched it on my iPad. I brought it in. Um, we had this amazing designer um, on, uh, on my team. We have a terrific digital services lead. Um, we discussed it. Um, it got iterated. And within a couple months, working with our internal IT department and with um, Outfront Media, there was a working prototype like out in the system. Um, and that's the middle one there. I think this might be a little bit later than that first initial prototype. I mean, four months from like just sketching something on an iPad to having it out there, it was to me kind of amazing. And so um, that team continued to develop um, the product and you'll see the latest versions out there um, uh, on the right-hand side. And I think it's an amazing piece of work. Um, they further refined it um, and added a dashboard to it. Uh, and so in most stations, um, depending on where you are in the station, you will see um, what's on the right hand side of the screen. You'll see the dashboard and you'll see these strip maps, which I think are just fantastic um, and uh, quite a bit of progress. So that was a way of, you know, again, trying to adhere to our principles of um, thinking about the storytelling. You know, what does the customer need to know where and when do they need to know it um, and respecting their time? What's the, the simplest, best way we can deliver this kind of information to them? So I, I think I just want to yeah. mention, right, when we talked about the systems work a couple slides ago, um, that work had to be done at the same time as this work for everything to work. Um, you know, as you guys know, we have a lot of different CBTC systems and different information systems that uh, generate data and all of the GTFS feeds and everything needs to consume this data and make it look into this fancy schmancy strip map that um, thank you for designing. But uh, at, at New York City Transit, this wasn't like that. It, it took a lot of innovation that actually came um, from the outside that we saw on Transit Twitter, no joke. So thank you guys very much. Um, and also inside innovation um, and, and different you know, talent that we brought in from, from um, various places and other cities. It, it's just, it really was remarkable to see how much skill and um, work it took to bring this all together into something that seamless. But, um, you know, for, for we have that spaghetti chart to, to show you guys um, how hard that was. Um, so back to our example of the sad control area at 116th Street. So we got rid of the walls of shame. Um, we were able to improve what actually appeared on the screens. What's left? Oh, OK, that guy. So let's talk about maps. So um, in rolling out the MTA's digital signage network, which, as I said, carries both advertising and travel information, not a lot of thought was given to how the maps would look on the screen. Um, our, con our current screens are usually 50 or 65 inches in diameter, but the resolution is HD resolution. So it's 1080 pixels wide by 1920 high, um, and just turn it over its side for the, the port um, for the landscape um, screens. This is standard HD. Um, it's OK for watching TV, but if you go to Costco today, you're, not, you're getting a 4K screen. So um, you know th this resolution is fine for the viewing distances that basically um, most advertising and most um, service information would be. It's not great for a map. So um, it's just not enough pixels. Uh, and so it's, it's hard to tell from this photo, but those of you who have been in New York, you've seen these maps. I don't think you're satisfied. We certainly weren't. Can't um, see the buses. Yeah. It's a big piece for me. Um, can really barely see the airports. So yeah. anyway. <laughs> 
they were they were we're working on it we weren't happy with them (laughs) we weren't happy with them um so we were thinking well um you know can we upgrade these to 4k and like you know the budget was the budget answer was hell no um you cannot um so what else could we do um we knew we had to look at print basically so um we took a holistic look at the existing CIC system and we asked ourselves not just like what should we put in the frames, but also do we even need frames? Um, you know, what print products would complement these awesome screens that we now had in the system? Um, you know, digital is dynamic, but it's low res um, in this application. Print is static, but it's very high res. So how could you each use each medium to its fullest? Um, and while we were looking at what was inside the frames, we also had to ask, is our official map still the best way to tell the story in the digital age? Um, for those of you who know the history, and this is Transicon, so I know you all know the history. Um, our map in New York uh, is a metro map that's unlike you know, almost any other in the world. It's pseudo-geographic. It was an attempt to um, move away from a diagrammatic style um, to try to tie the city and its neighborhoods better with the subway system. Um, it was very much a response to this map which preceded it. Um, and because it's Transicon, again, you know what this map is. It's probably hanging in your living room. Um, uh, you know, So it's, it's arguable that in 1979, the map on the left was arguably the best way to tell the story of how the city and the subway related to each other. You know, um, you know all apologies to Mr. Vignelli. You know, it's, it, this map lasted for 40, over 40 years. You know, it did definitely serve the city and had great value to it. Um, but the, at the time, they were working with the medium that they had, which was print. There was no digital. Everyone didn't have a computer in their pocket. So um, in looking at maps, we want to think about, um, you know, is, does this still make sense? So for the future of our maps, we're looking beyond what, you know, beyond you at what our peers are doing. And this is probably the first time in decades that New York City has done this. Um, and But we're also looking back at our incredible design heritage, um, Vignelli, Unimark, all the amazing things that um, Waterhouse, Waterhouse yes, Fuentes. Yes, um, uh, the whole sort of family that came from uh, Benelli, um to think, you know, what, what could be next for our maps. So the maps you see here are part of our map pilot, which we launched a year and a half ago, two years ago. Um, we currently have these maps up in uh, nine stations and on two of our shuttle trains. Um, and so if you're in New York, please check them out. We have a QR code so people can um, leave us feedback. You can also see these maps online and fill out the, the survey online. Um, and so in these stations, you'll see in a full array of four maps. It's an entirely new subway diagram. It's Vignelli inspired, but it is not the original Vignelli. Um, the map that I'm actually most excited about, which is a geographical map of New York City, which shows the subway lines uh, and the rapid bus routes, um, which I think was going to lay sort of lay the mental groundwork for thinking about buses in New York City, which I'm very excited about. You'll see a, a uh, enhanced um, bus map and you'll see an enhanced neighborhood map. So in thinking about um, storytelling and respecting the audience, um, uh, we think these maps do it for um, that station and so it's uh, for the stations. So um, yeah, we're, we're very much open to feedback. We wanna hear what people think. Um, these are very much a pilot still, um, but everything we virtually everything we've heard, the feedback has been amazing. So we hope the feedback um, uh, continues to be so. And when, as we scale up and put, see these in more stations. Great, so thanks, Joe. Um, I just you know wanted to give us some time to open the floor, take some questions and, and have Reed um, talk a little bit. Um, Just wanted to, again, thank you guys so much. We know how hard transit can be, how risk averse this industry is, um, how many brick walls we all run into every day. Um, So just wanted to thank you again for your tireless advocacy um, and uh, support for this industry. Let's keep running into those brick walls together and uh, hopefully we'll get, you know, more and more folks back on public transit as soon as possible. 